Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 14th, 2018. First up, this is from sciencenews.org with the launch of TESS, T-E-S-S. -S. NASA will boost its search for exoplanets. NASA is stepping up its research for planets outside our solar system. Its next exoplanet hunting telescope, the Transit Exoplanet Survey, if I can say it right, survey satellite, TESS is due to launch from Cape Canaveral on the evening of April 16th. This will actually be the first launch that they do above the uh, Falcon 9 space ro rocket. So um, they're hoping to be able to find a lot more possible planets with this thing. Uh, following the Kepler Space Telescope's discovery of more than 5,000 possible exoplanets since 2009, tests will continue the galactic census, flagging more planetary candidates for further study. Astronomers expect tests to find about 20,000 planets in its first two years in operation focusing on nearby bright stars. That's what they're looking for here. Nearby um, bright stars that can have planets, and especially this one is powerful enough to be able to find uh, planets orbiting that are maybe twice the size of Earth or a little bit less. So they will be able to uh, stand a better chance on finding habitable planets. It's very easy to find planets now the size of Jupiter or larger, but to be able to find rocky Earth-type planets is a little bit more difficult. And if you see in the animation here, they're going to put this on a... Uh, rather odd orbit. It's going to be on an orbit between Earth and Moon and it's going to be on a tilted kind of eccentric type of orbit and they say by doing it this way they use less fuel on the rocket to stabilize itself. It can use the help with the Earth and the Moon's gravity to help stabilize the orbit and not have to make so many adjustments and uh, waste fuel. And if you look on the picture the blue part of the orbit is where it's going to be searching for planets and the orange part of the orbit is where it's going to be sending information back to Earth so that they can go over it and see if they can find planets. So this is kind of cool too and it's showing more uh, use of the Falcon 9 rocket which I've been talking about a lot. And there's a lot more information that I'm talking about here and all of the links to all the articles I will be talking about will be down in the description below so check it out. And next from uh, popularscience.com something is weird something weird is happening to the Gulf Stream current. Uh, they say it's been since 1950 they've been tracking it's been uh, decreasing by about 15% in speed and that may really bode not too well for those people especially in Europe that count on the Gulf Stream current. Um, sometimes they call it the Gulf Stream conveyor belt to bring that warm air up to Europe to keep the climate a little bit warmer because if you look at the latitude that uh, it is on, um, it's actually where you would expect it to be a lot colder because it's more in alignment with uh, parts of Canada than it is with the uh, more temperate regions of the United States but because of this conveyor belt that works and tracking it back to a direct uh, evidence back to the um, what is this they tracked it back to I think the 1600s maybe let me see here on the thing what it says here um, tracking it well from uh, since 1950 they say it's uh, slowed down by 15 percent and then they've uh, indirectly tracked it back uh, about from 1850 back back to 1850 they tracked it and it slowed down about 15 percent since uh, 1850, so that's a total of about 30% slowing down by indirect evidence, such as, I guess, by measuring the grain sizes in the sediment, they can tell whether it was uh, moving faster or slower. But, uh, yeah, this could mean for uh, uh, sea levels rising on parts of the East Coast, and it could also mean uh, a little bit colder weather for people in Europe and maybe some other effects besides that, too. Who knows what's going to happen, but it's uh, just something to be aware of, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting read on the article and stuff like that. Um, they say it may be part of the uh, shifting climate, um, which there's arguments about that too. I've got my own ideas about the climate change. I think the majority of it's probably more natural change, although I think human beings are having a big influence on it, but I don't think they're the prime influence right now, but they are a big enough influence that we probably do need to be concerned about that. And uh, But things like this, I don't know how much power we have to do with something like this, uh, something this big, but just something to be aware of and something to check out. And next, this is kind of interesting, especially for you people that like to play video games. Um, I'm not so much a gamer as I used to be because I just haven't found the kind of game, but this is from sciencemag.org. Watch artificial intelligence create a 3D model of a person from just a few seconds of video. Now, in the past, they could do it. It was real expensive. They could put um, different um, little dots on you and then get this real expensive equipment to measure uh, every little surface area of your body and make you into a 3D model. Or uh, they were even selling for a while these action figures to where they could either scan your body or scan your head and make a real accurate 
representation. You could buy an action figure. These, supposedly, all you have to do is stand in front of a regular camera, even a webcam would work, and turn around. You have your arms out a little bit, and then you turn around, and uh, so you, they can get a 360-degree view of you with a regular, ordinary camera, and they can make a model that's accurate to within about 5 millimeters, which is roughly a quarter of an inch, and then from there you can adjust it to if you think the model uh, added a little bit of weight, you can make yourself skinnier, you can make yourself heavier, whatever. You can do some adjustments to it, but evidently this is a lot easier to do than the old way they used to do it. Uh, it says the system has three stages. First, it analyzes a video a few seconds long of someone moving, preferably turning 360 to show all sides, and then for each frame it creates a silhouette separating the person from the background based on machine learning techniques in which computers learn a task from many examples. It roughly estimates the 3D body shape and location of joints. In the second stage, it unposes the virtual human created from each frame, making them all stand the arms out in a T shape and combines information about the T-posed people into one more accurate model. Finally, in the third stage, it applies color and texture to the model based on recorded hair, clothing, and skin. It says it does have, uh, although it has an accuracy of 5 millimeter, it struggles with things like long hair and skirts. So, uh, But I imagine, you know, that would be so minor. You could actually, for clothing you could add that later when you're doing uh, a rendering if you were doing it for some type of animation or some type of game or something like that basically uh, that's the kind of stuff you pick in a game anyway what hairstyle you want so I don't consider that being uh, that great of a deal and the nice thing about it too is you can download the PDF if you look in the link here and I'll give you the link to the PDF too the PDF is very readable now obviously they use some really advanced calculations here and there in it but the the basics of the PDF is a really good read and the guys that, I'm not going to try to mention all these names, there's five guys from Braunschweig, Germany, um, the Computer Graphics Lab, and then also the Max Planck Institute of Informatics, and for, yeah, and for, yeah, informatics um, on the campus in Germany, wherever that is. I'm not going to try to even figure out some of these things because they're um, not easy to pronounce. But, yeah, they uh, do a whole abstract paper in it, and it doesn't seem like any of this is really, um, other than the uh, some of the equations, None of this is hard for the average person to figure out, but if they can bring this, I mean, it, it's nothing that you can go out and buy next week probably, but if they can bring this to uh, just average computers to where you could do that and 3D render yourself, that would uh, be great advances for animation and for games. Um, I think it's really fantastic. It really it piqued my interest, especially when I saw the PDF was very readable for just your average people. And then uh, last up, I can't find a lot of information. I never can for these things, although I like them. This one particularly is the Green Grand Prix, um, the Toyota Green Grand Prix, it's called, and that was held on April 13th. Um, I've also um, found uh, I've also found their Facebook page supporting it, but it's still very scant information. But basically, if you watch the video from uh, the 18 Channel 18 WETM um, news thing, which is um, in the middle of the uh, link I'll give you here, you can you can play the video. Uh, they give you the highlights of it. It's basically vehicles, um, uh, especially alternate type of fuel vehicles and hybrid vehicles and stuff like that. They're going for a, a mileage competition. And uh, my friend Jer, who was the one that um, told me about this, I would have missed out on it. My friend Jer from the UK, lives near London, uh, told me about this. And uh, he said there were also some electric vehicles in it too. Um, I think some, pe some people go as a serious competition. Some people go just to test vehicles and drive the track. But they give you that whole day before the rest of the Grand Prix or I should say Grand Prix, as they say in Europe, but uh, yeah, I give you a chance to test vehicles and stuff like that and new innovations. High schools and colleges, a lot of them participate in it, and uh, there's various trophies awarded. I wish they gave way more detail on it, but um, you have to follow a lot of links to try to, it's a lot of work really to get things, but for those people that are interested, I'll give you the um, original links that I uh, chose myself, and then all those have uh, fork off links that will give you more information to it, but I just wish they would promote more of this stuff because I would probably sit and watch, and they're probably out there somewhere. I've tried on YouTube to find them, but um, some of these teams probably do have video channels and videos you can watch, but I would sit down and watch probably um, a whole team's uh, start to finish, like say if they started broadcasting a month before the event and things they're doing with the car and stuff like that all the way up to the event and what happened. I would actually follow that. I mean, to me, that's a really great mini documentary, but trying to find them. Some teams are better at doing it than others, depending on the place, but... Um, if anybody, and if anybody in your in the comments, if anybody finds more on this too, especially uh, any teams that really did a lot of promotion, that's the problem with a lot of this. They really need to hire some media promoters, even if they're uh, college students that are uh, wanting to get into media and marketing. Hire a couple of those people even part-time for the day to come out there and promote the event better because I love these kind of things. 
Uh, they're very geeky, they're very technology oriented, and they're very much into science, but um, they never give me anything but just little bits and pieces and highlights that I can find. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I'll catch you next week.